Hello, and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Portland Candidate Forum for the special election runoff on August 11th, 2020 for City Council Position 2. I'm Debbie Kay, President of the League of Women Voters of Portland and the Forum Moderator for today. The League is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to making democracy work. We believe democracy works best when we are informed about the issues that are important to our communities. We're presenting this forum so that Portlanders can get to know the two candidates running for position two for city council in this special election, Dan Ryan and Loretta Smith. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we cannot hold in-person debates or forums. So I'm joining you from the Metro East Community Media Studio in Gresham, and our candidates are joining from their particular locations. We are grateful for support from the Carol and Velma Sailing Foundation, the League of Women Voters of Portland Education Fund, the Weiss Foundation, the Sarah Frewing Fund, and our media partner, Metro East Community Media. And now for the forum rules. The candidates may give two minute opening statements, then they will both have 90 seconds to answer questions that we've prepared. And then each will have a two minute closing. And Mr. Smith, excuse me, Ms. Smith and Mr. Ryan, <laughs> I request uh, that you adhere to the allotted time as we've described. I will be getting cues from the Metro East uh, staff. As determined by a Susan B. Anthony dollar coin toss, Ms. Smith will give the first opening statement and then we will alternate who answers the questions. So Ms. Smith, please give your opening. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us here today. I am running for Portland City Council because the city of Portland has changed from the way that I know it. I think that we need to be addressing poverty, the widespread poverty in every corner of the city of Portland. As a former Multnomah County Commissioner, I know how important it is to help those who are underserved, unemployed, and who are rent burdened in this community. Even prior to uh, COVID, uh, we were having problems with folks not being able to get appropriate housing, people who are sleeping on our city streets and not having enough to eat. I worked for Senator Wyden um, during the last uh, Great Recession and ensured that federal dollars for recovery made it to the city of Portland. I spent nearly a decade overseeing a multi-billion dollar budget at Multnomah County. Relationships for me, not just with Oregon's federal delegation, but with other delegations and at the national level has helped me to serve our most vulnerable in the city of Portland. The only way to solve homelessness in the housing affordability crisis is to continue to get federal government back into the game of homelessness. If you look back when they started divesting in our communities, that's when the problem became a big issue for the city of Portland and for us nationwide. I wanna be a voice for those who are vulnerable, a voice for women, and a voice for making sure that recovery makes sure that everyone is supported. Thank you very much. Mr. Ryan, your turn for two minutes. Yes, um, thank you, League of Women Voters. Thank you, Debbie, it's great to be with you all today. Uh, a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Portland. I went to Roosevelt High School. I am the youngest of eight. I have six older brothers, and I was the first in my family to go on to college and graduate. It's a little odd when you're the youngest of eight to be the first in your family to uh, finish college. And for me, it was because there were a lot of love in my family. However, we had mental health and substance abuse issues. So at a young age, I had survival instincts that allowed me to really lean into teachers and mentors. And I was in every club and every sport you can imagine just to stay busy. Uh, I had a great career after I left um, University of Oregon in New York City and in Seattle. And then in 1995, I had a doctor give me some grim news. Um, after being in the hospital twice with pneumocystis pneumonia, I was told um, I had six months to a year to live. And so that's what brought me home. And I figured my sister would be the one person that could put up with me as a patient. The good news is the, uh, the science caught up with me. And uh, the drugs worked, the medicines worked. And about six months later, that same doctor said, Dan, you gotta suit up and go back to work. So I've really been blessed the last 25 years to serve my city, my hometown, at Portland State University, at the School of Finding Performing Arts, and as the Director of Development for the First Capital Campaign. 
at Oregon Ballet Theater, um, keeping dancers on stage during the Great Recession. And I was also um, a part of the Portland Public School Board. I ran and served there for several years and was actually the chair of the school board after, after a year. We went through these contentious 4-3 votes. And at the end of that, for some reason, even though I was on the three side, they decided I was the right person to be the chair. I then was asked to be the CEO of the Portland Schools Foundation, which quickly became all hands raised. So they could really honor and really lean into those school districts east of Portland Public Schools that are a part of Portland that actually have the highest um, demographics of people of color, poverty, and new arrivals. If you would go ahead with the, this first question I'm going to ask, if elected, Mr. Ryan, what would be your top three priorities as a city commissioner? Yeah, great question. Um, I think anyone running would uh, say this. The top three priorities will be homelessness and housing, uh, one. Two will be police reform. And three will be, uh, three will be the economic um, recovery and really just how to handle uh, COVID meets this great uh, economic depression that we're, that's coming about. I do believe that the homelessness and housing crisis that's been escalating over the last decade is only obviously getting worse. The projections nationally are um, around 45 million people could be uh, out of their sheltered homes in the next couple months if the federal government doesn't respond. I, um, this is personal to me. My third oldest brother perished on the streets six years ago. He um, had a life of, that was going all right until he stopped taking his meds and stopped seeing his uh, therapist, if you will, and then started medicating with, uh, with drugs. And with his, multiple, with his multiple diagnosis, there was just no care for him. I think we've been looking at this in a too simplistic way. I think we have at least three categories of people that need housing and shelter. There are people like my brother, Tim. There are people that are our essential workers that haven't been able to afford to live in Portland for some time. And also those that are just on the brink. And right now there's a lot of people on the brink. And that means 10 more seconds. And so I am looking forward to tackling these priorities and looking forward to have further dialogue over the next 45 minutes. Thank you. Ms. Smith, the same question to you. If elected, what would be your top three priorities as city commissioner? It would certainly be police reform, small business recovery, and housing. We have a lot of folks who are in our city who are unemployed, underemployed, and rent burdened. I think that people and businesses are hopeless at this point, and we need to give them a guiding light back to stability and growth for the future. I know we need bold leadership. This is not a time for job training or for someone who has not been able to weather tough times to see things through the end. And I think right now we're looking for unity and that's something that we have to have. So we have to change what we see on our city streets. I spent nearly a decade overseeing a multi-billion dollar budget at Multnomah County as a commissioner. Prior to that, I worked for Senator Ron Wyden at the beginning of the last great recession, ensuring that federal recovery dollars made it into Portland. I have that track record, I have the leadership, and I have the skill set to make sure that we come out of recovery ahead and that everyone in every zip code is allowed to not just thrive, not just survive, but thrive in our city. Thank you. Our next question, Ms. Smith, will go to you. Yes. Concerning the pandemic's impact on Portland, what additional challenges will COVID-19 pose for the city in the coming months and years? And how do you think the city should address those? Well, I think the, the COVID-19 crisis certainly exposed uh, the health and the health and welfare of communities of color. And I also think that we're, we're thinking a lot about the evictions, the crisis, from COVID-19, what's gonna happen. But we're not talking about what happens when the state of emergency ends and people still haven't been able to return to work. The eviction moratorium does not protect renters from eviction for rent that becomes late after the state of emergency ends. And so for me, this is just an opportunity for us to start thinking about those things. We also have to think about how do we pay for this huge, amount of overtime that Portland police is stacking up. People are feeling really hopeless. 
We need someone who's been in crisis before, who's been effective, who understands the budget, who understands state government, who has relationships on the federal government, and who has been successful at identifying federal resources that will come into a city to make us whole. Thank you. And Mr. Ryan, same question. I'd be glad to repeat it if you wish. Concerning the pandemic's impact on Portland, what additional challenges do you perceive COVID-19 will pose for the city in the coming months and years? And how do you think the city should address those? Thanks. Uh, you know, we need, we need several scenario plans for this. Uh, I really do think just from reading, you know, New York Times and other uh, out media outlets, the severity of the economic devastation is, is, hasn't been realized yet. This is going to be much worse than the Great Recession, and we have to figure out how to take care of ourselves. Um, the, uh, the Great Depression is meeting the Spanish flu, if you will. None of us were alive for those two events for the most part. And we are um, in a crisis. Uh, I have a lot of friends in small businesses, which makes up 85% of Portland's economy, people with, in the music venues. The music stopped and died in mid-March, and one month later, $8 million in revenues was lost to our city. That's just one example. The truth is, um, this is a devastation. And we at the city of Portland need to repurpose ourselves to figure out how we pe keep people sheltered and keep people fed. Um, I think that we have to have a scenario that's that focused on just surviving. Um, public health behavior change clearly has been challenging for many people in our country. And we have to be very crisp and clear as elected officials on what that means. As someone that survived a pandemic myself, I know what it's like to take the complexity of science and be very crisp about what you need to do. I think that the status quo that has got us into the mess even pre-COVID and pre-economic devastation won't get it done. It's time to have a creative leader from the community to lead us forward. Thank you. The next question will also be to you and still on this same topic. Do you agree that service cuts for Portland are inevitable in the coming year? And if so, what criteria would you use for the service cuts and how would you decide on the amount to cut? Well, first you need, we need to focus on who is going to be most affected. And anytime there is any economic devastation, it's always the most marginalized communities that have had the disparities forever that are going to be hit the hardest. Communities of color, people in poverty, new arrivals. So we, as a generous, uh, caring, humane soul of the city, has to prioritize those populations first and foremost. And we need to make sure that we know who those populations are and that we measure what success looks like. I really do believe one of the scenarios is going to be success looks like keep, keeping people sheltered and keeping people fed. And that is, I think, what we first and foremost have to focus on. And I do believe there'll be a lot of repurposing. It'll take a lot of partnerships with the city and the county, um, looking where we can streamline. But there are going to be cuts in both. Um, budgets are both coming down because currency has been falling for the private sector for months now, and that always lags behind in the public sector. And so we need to be braced for this reality. And hopefully we'll get our sea legs back in 21, 22, when, it, when we hope for the, the vaccine. Thank you. Ms. Smith, the same question. Do you agree that service cuts for Portland are inevitable in the coming year? And if so, what criteria would you use for service cuts and how would you decide on the amount? Oh, pr prior to COVID-19, um, we were talking about poverty and the impacts of poverty on our city in every zip code. Since the city has a delayed tax collection, that was July 15th and I paid my business taxes last week, we won't have an updated economic forecast until late August or early September. Things will likely be more bleak than we have anticipated. So for me, as I'm looking at how to pay for our most um, critical issues like housing, I look at how the federal government has spent the last 30 years divesting from affordable housing, which is why this crisis is nationwide and not unique to Portland. I think that we need to pay for the most uh, critical core services of uh, the city of Portland. And we're going to have to take a, a great look at some of the other uh, services that we pay with, uh, with funding that's not in the permanent budget. 
one time only resources are going to have to be used for core essential services. Thank you. For our next question, we're going to talk about the police. Uh, Ms. Smith, you will have the first answer. Yes. Concerning law enforcement policies and actions, what has the Portland Police Bureau done well and not so well in its interactions <laughs> with the protesters? Well, you know, that's a, that's a huge question. Um, I think that we, that we end these protests uh, by, by not having federal um, officers down on the ground. One of the things that I feel like we should do in terms of police reform and to dealing with what's going on, I dropped a police reform and accountability package with five main points. One was dealing with taking away the qualified immunity, uh, taking 20% off of their $250 million budget, which would equal out to $50 million. Three, take away the chokehold, the tear gas, the rubber bullets, all the acoustic uh, long range devices that they use for crowd control. And most importantly, take care of putting citizens at the uh, front of the, of the class in terms of identifying excessive force in the manuals that the police uh, follow and to making sure that we codify that by putting that on a ballot measure in the November ballot. And I'm happy to say that Commissioner Hardesty has been pushing forward one of my items about putting uh, citizens review on the ballot in November, because I think that is what's missing. I think uh, constant conversation with the evening protesters and to make very clear that th this is not Black Lives Matter, what we see on our street. We have groups that have co-opted this movement to make, them, to make it their own, and it's causing a lot of turmoil with the police. Thank you. Mr. Smith, your turn on the same question. Okay. Hey, um, well, Mr. Ryan, I don't, you know. <laughs> I do that again. It's I'm okay. so, so sorry. It's, fine. It's, it's that movie. I do apologize. Yeah. Um, uh, your, your questions start off with what the police department has done well. What have they done well? What okay. have they not done well? And in the interactions with protesters. I think that the new police chief, who's only been sworn in for a brief period of time, uh, Chuck Lavelle, uh, Lavelle, has done um, the best job that anyone could in such a stressful transition. I think that uh, when I listen to him speak, when I have seen his interactions, um, I think you know he's really trying to figure out how to lead a new police department. I also think that there's plenty of police uh, that are fine. I think the police union and the, the infrastructure of the culture has obviously been um, lacking accountability for decades and de ever since the beginning of time. Uh, there's just a lack of, um, let's just say they've been getting a bite with murder forever. And it's, if you look at the legalities and how they stack up from the laws and from the union contract, we've had so many incidents in Portland where they are, they are suspended from their job and then they're able to get a payout um, from the city, which we all pay for. So the good news is I've never been endorsed by the police union, um, unlike my opponent, nor received large amounts of money like my opponent. So I do think it'll allow me to have a very fresh perspective on how to go hard and deliberate and methodical when, we, when the cameras stop running and we have to do the really hard work of police reform, which is a part of the police union contract. And I'd like to say that the police union have not endorsed me in this campaign. And they have not given me any money and I have not taken any money. And I'm sure that my opponent has probably interviewed with them. So he is not being very uh, genuine when he speaks about my record. He should speak about his own. I would like to limit the conversation to the questions at hand, please, because otherwise we end up with a significant imbalance in opinion and in statement. Thank you. The next question about the police is that people talk about, quote, defunding the police. What kind of changes to police responsibilities would you recommend? And Mr. Ryan, we start with you. Sure. When I look at system change, it really is that. It's a system. And what I like about what Commissioner Hardesty was able to do with the repurposing of the 15 million was that it was a deliberate plan with capacity that was already built with the street response team, for example. 
they, they have skill sets that the police department has been saying that they do not have, whether it be in de-escalation skills or trauma-informed training. And so by expanding uh, investments, repurposing the 15 million towards community organizations such as that, we begin to build that new system of community safety. And that's what I think we need to move forward with is a community safety system. Within that system is a police department that's been reformed culturally, where they move out of the military stance and become true guardians. I'm absolutely enthusiastic about the ballot measure that Joanne Hardesty is putting on for the voters in November that will allow us as elected officials to work with the community to, do, to push forward with these reforms and actually do the methodical work that is involved in, in culture change. Thank you. Same question to you, Ms. Smith. People talk about defunding the police. What kind of changes to police responsibilities would you recommend? I think we need to narrow their focus. Uh, police need to be focused on crime not on criminalizing uh, folks who are in poverty. I talked about this early in the campaign. It should not be a crime to be poor in this community. We know that even prior to COVID that we had unprecedented uh, prosperity here in this city, but there still was a significant number of our residents in every zip code that were not experiencing this economic boom. So I think if the police focus and they focus uh, not on criminalizing or militarizing our police, that we can get back to a space where we can reimagine what public safety looks like, and we can start instituting my five-point plan. And I do thank Commissioner Hardesty for pushing my uh, fifth item on my plan to making sure that citizen involvement is critical and key to a new movement. I also believe that we should take away 20% of their budget and to make sure that the qualified immunity and that the, the uh, tear gas and the uh, rubber bullets and the chokehold is taken away. Until we do that, we're not gonna have a, a police uh, system here that's just, we're gonna have one who's gonna be policing folks who are not, who are not able to, to help themselves in our city streets. Thank you. Our next question is about parks. What do you see, Ms. Smith, as current and future challenges and possible solutions to the beloved parks of Portland? Well, uh, there is no question about it. We have to maintain and grow parks funding. One of the first places we need to look is at the city of Portland's debt portfolio to figure out what, pro what projects will be uh, falling off of the debt service portfolio and the opportunities that can be garnered from that funding being freed up. In the same vein, I think we should look at the city's debt policy and re revisit it as well. Our park system is a community treasure. That means we need the entire community engaged in maintaining and growing it. Private citizens enjoy the amenities and improved neighborhood quality that the parks have. The business community benefits from the tourism our park system generate and improved neighborhood quality that often includes their businesses. And so we need to include everyone in maintaining our city parks. Thank you. Mr. Ryan, same question. What do you see as current and future challenges for the beloved parks of Portland and possible solutions? Yeah, uh, you know, when you gotta always play to your strengths. And in the city of Portland, one of our strengths is definitely the parks. I always say it's parks, arts and culture, schools, and then our creative industries in music and film and small businesses. So parks are a big part of that. When people come to visit me from out of state, when people consider moving to Portland, they're always blown away by our parks uh, system. I think it's an opportunity right now to actually make parks essential in a way beyond just the beauty and the fresh air that we're receiving from them. But right now in COVID-19, they've become essential, I know, to my neighbors, especially those that live in apartments nearby or a place that they can get refuge. Uh, we all know that being outside and getting fresh air is very important. We also know that the big one's coming. There's gonna be a tsunami someday. And how can our parks be regional centers scattered throughout the community, like our schools, where people can go for refuge and for supplies 
and whether it's Wi-Fi and, and food and such. So I really think we have to elevate parks into more of an essential service of the city. I believe our, uh, our business model, if you will, of the parks has been perplexing to me for some time. And so I look forward to building a new business model. And with my private revenue experience, it's exactly the skill set needed on city council for that. Thank you. The next question to you, Mr. Ryan, is on the climate action plan. How would you rate the city's progress in meeting the goals of its own climate action plan? What additional steps does Portland need to take to meet those goals? Yeah, Portland, again, playing to its strengths. Uh, we have a population that is wildly supportive of doing what is right in terms of the climate crisis. We have the opportunity to be the leader in building a green economy. What's that's been confusing to me is we pass this measure and it's like a lot of things that happen from the status quo is the government officials and leaders do a very poor job of educating the population on what, what success looks like. And so I think we need clear metrics on what success looks like. Clearly, uh, clean air would be the top of the list that I could come up with. And I think everyone could agree on that. And then you have to move backwards to see in one year's time, what progress have we made towards those goals? This to me would be such an opportunity to bring the city together to really have an implementation of the measures. Um, when the measure was passed, they had some goals. We need to promote those, have like a dashboard for the whole community to understand, and then make sure that we're all in, that we're making progress towards them. And right now it's uh, confusing to see, it seems like we're in an incomplete phase at the moment. I would like to have more information and more importantly, when I'm on city council to make sure that the population understands that we're making progress. Thank you. And Ms. Smith, on climate action, how would you rate the city's progress in meeting the goals of our climate action plan? And what additional steps does Portland need to take to meet those goals? I think that it's great that we have a plan, number one, but I think we need to do a better job of uh, centering frontline communities and communities of color. I testified in support of the plan and how we need to change laws and put additional money on the table and directly confront the crisis. Because as you know, when we put infrastructure in our cities, we usually put that infrastructure in more affluent neighborhoods. What we do know is that some of the most toxic areas in our city are aligned with communities of color. If you look at I-5 and I-205 in the Jade District, they're parallel exactly to where communities of color live. And we need to invest more with electric buses in those communities first and make sure that we have a good health and economic opportunity for those communities as it relates to the climate action plan and to make sure that those communities understand that we care about them, that they're important and that they're critical to the survival of our economic um, security here in the city of Portland. Thank you. Our next question is on homelessness and Ms. Smith, you will answer first. Yes. How do you think Portland can address homelessness in our city in a way that keeps the people who are homeless and that houses them and helps them while keeping our public spaces safe and accessible for everyone? Well, I think we're off to a good start with passing the ballot measure to help homeless folks who need assistance with uh, wraparound supports, uh, drug and alcohol counseling, but we have to be in the business of housing first and making sure we get those folks who are unsheltered on our city streets housed immediately. As I said before, homelessness is a big issue. It is a problem that not only is taking over the cities on the West Coast, but it's a nationwide issue. And I bet if you track when we began to have really, really big problems with homelessness, it, you can lead it back to 30 years ago. The federal government, again, they took away and divested in homeless services. And if you follow that trend over the years, you could see the homeless, homelessness and uh, support services, needs for support services rise. I think that we need to have folks who are bold, who understand that we cannot do business as usual as it relates to homeless. 
We need to take some of those one time only dollars that we have and, and upgrade and, and, and land bank and buy some of those small hotels and making sure that people who are rent burdened and who are at the verge of being homeless, that we provide them with an affordable place to live. Today, we're not providing them with that. Thank you. And Mr. Ryan, same question. How can yeah. Portland address how homelessness in our city in a way that helps the people who are houseless while keeping our public spaces safe and accessible for everyone? Yeah, I would, uh, again, this one is so personal for me and it was one of my main motivations to run for office because uh, I feel as though the city and the county leaders are the status quo over the last uh, over 10 years. They just haven't been getting it done. Uh, I, I, although I was supportive of the measure that passed this last spring, like many people, I was disappointed that it didn't have a strategy. There wasn't an action plan. So I really think we need to be more accountable, way more accountable, with clear measurable goals of what success looks like. I also think that we've, again, simplified it um, too often and we need to break it down into the different tiers. I think the people that are involved at the strategy table need to be, it needs to be deeper and wider and it needs to also include those that aren't getting contracts from the city or the county. It needs to include people that are affected by homelessness, the small businesses, the many people that I know that saw their business receipts and go down, their profits go down, uh, the arts uh, organizations downtown who've lost subscribers because people literally don't feel safe to come to the theater. I think we need to be more honest about the problem and then we need to be more crisp and clear about what success looks like. You measure it and you have clear goals. And again, the meetings just can't be kiss the ring meetings between the elected officials, their staffs, and the people receiving the contracts. And I look forward to being that person from the outside that comes in and, and gets this done. Thank you. Um, our next question is about the city charter review, which will begin soon. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Ryan, what changes, if any, to the structure of city government would you favor? Yeah, well, first of all, this was the other motivation that, that got me to run. Um, I remember when I first moved back to Portland, we had a vote on this, and I think I was one of less than 30% that wanted to see it change. I'm happy to report that it, it, it looks as though there's finally, um, it's coming from the community that they really do want this. However, the status quo must like this, or it probably would have been changed a long time ago. And so I know that this will be a very methodical process. And we have to catch up with all the other cities of our size that did this a century ago. So we're about a century behind. The kind of government that I want is definitely one where there's the people get to select their representatives. I think that you need to have geographic representation. I also think that we as counselors, as city commissioners, need to get out of the business of pretending we run a bureau and that, that instead we um, stay focused on the top three to five priorities at all times. And then maybe a $5.6 billion organization might be running much better than it has been. And so I will act as if on day one, I will not be sequestered to a bureau micromanagement duty. I will make sure the people at the top are hired and supervised very uh, well, about 5% of my time, but 95% of my time will definitely be focused on the top priorities like your team at the city government should be focused on. So I'm really happy to report that um, my goal is to take away my power over the next couple of years and have a new city, uh, have a new city charter. Thank you for that answer. Uh, Ms. Smith, the city charter review will begin soon. What changes yes. any to the structure? Well, I think uh, job number one should be to change actually the representation model. I know when I, I ran for Multnomah County Commission in 2010, I ran for uh, County District, uh, District 2, which represented Inner North and Northeast uh, Portland. And that was the first time that I ran for office. And I know had I run for a citywide office at that point, I probably wouldn't have gotten elected. But I got elected in an office where people knew me, I knew the issues, they supported me, and they gave me a mandate of what they wanted me to work on. And that's why I supported working really hard to um, make sure that I support seniors and older adults, uh, build an infrastructure for, um, for our youth. And so I think it's important that we expand the city council so that it represents every uh, zip code in our uh, community and that there's representation. I think that we need to change the actual form of the mayor and uh, 
the, the commissioners, we need to make sure we have someone who is a professional that can actually take us into the next century so that we can be about the business of working with the people, identifying opportunities for us to exchange and to be able to identify uh, support services for everyone in our community. Thank you. Our next question is again about demonstrations and protests in Portland. And it comes to you, Ms. Smith. What lessons, if any, have you learned from the Black Lives Matter demonstrations and protests in Portland? How would these lessons inform your approach to serving as city commissioner? I think I have a uh, lived uh, approach being a single black mother who raised a, a black son in this community. I understand the successes and the challenges of, of doing that. I understand what it looks like when my 16 year old son got pulled over by the police and now the trauma that he feels when the police ride alongside him. I also know that the way that I think that we should end these protests is not by continued altercations between the police and the public, that we need to address the issues at hand that are gonna allow us to move forward together. The protests are not gonna stop until people see real solid movement, until they see bold leadership that is gonna sit down with the evening protesters and identify what it is that they want. And it's not gonna stop until the federal folks who are on our city streets, stop criminalizing our citizens here. We need to make sure that we kick all the federal police out of our city. We don't need them. They're escalating all the extremists that are in our city streets in the evenings and we don't want it. And I want my city back. So we could do that first and foremost and let that be the city council's first job to uh, cut ties with all federal uh, law enforcement agencies and make sure that we bring the people to the table. Thank you. Mr. Ryan, to you, what lessons, if any, have you learned from the Black Lives Matter demonstrations and protests in Portland? And how would these lessons influence or inform your approach to serving as city commissioner? Yeah. As a white ally, uh, you go through your own journey of unpacking your privilege. Um, I do believe that the process of unpacking your white guilt is, uh, is something that takes years. And it's something that I hope every white Portlander is now finally, more and more finally doing it. It's not about being loud. It's not about trying to be the, woke, the most woke person in the room. It's about um, looking at your privilege and your place in it and how you've been a part of it. I've been focused on having an intentional multicultural life. It's been put upon me with my family. Um, many of my siblings have married outside of our race. So I know the difference when I'm with one of my um, nephews and nieces of color and how that's different when I'm with my blue-eyed nephews and nieces. I'm not in their shoes, but you get to experience that. And so as a white ally, I've always been very intentional about my multicultural existence and also advocating getting results for communities of color. I think that as we come forward, I've been thinking about this a lot, who isn't? Um, it's almost like when I was a kid, I used to obsess over the Middle East uh, peace accords and Jimmy Carter and the methodical process that, they went, that we went through. Now it's in our own city. So how are we going to bring together people that clearly don't sit at the same table together, the different fractions within the protesters, the police, the business people that are affected by this and make sure everyone's unarmed and no cell phones in the meeting. And I'm the type of person that'll be comfortable with how intense that meeting will be, but we got to start talking to each other. Thank you. This will be our last question before closing remarks. And it goes to you, Mr. Ryan. Based on your experience with open and accountable elections this year, do you have suggestions for improvements to that program? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought this up. I want to first of all say that uh, Commissioner Fritz and her uh, st sticking with that in her tenure, uh, I, I really do believe it was wildly improved. Um, I think what you saw, um, my opponent and I both experienced this, a lot of people ran for office and it allowed over 10 people in our race alone to actually mount very strong campaigns. It's community driven, it comes from the ground up. Um, I love the fact that it, it, it definitely diversified who was able to run and um, it's something that we have to covenant. I think it's actually a best practice um, going forward. We have to make sure we have more accountability. It's, it's not easy, trust me. I mean, I, I had some gifts come in over 250 and 
you know, went over, you know, the seven days of, you know, one was a brother that's going through chemo and forgot he gave 250. And so, you know, we have to have better systems to check those things. Um, but it's really, and then we return the money, of course, but we just got to make sure that we covenant and we use it properly because it really has improved the diversity and inclusion of people running for office. I'm excited about it. But again, when I get in office, I will be able to do some fine tooth, fine tooth um, comb, um, clearing out some of the cobwebs of this. And it, we have to keep the integrity of the program. We don't want to see what happened last time when a couple candidates abused it. And then it became, um, you know, it wasn't a favorable, but 85% plus people approved this measure. And we got to make sure we get it right. And I look forward to being a part of that process. Thank you. Ms. Smith, how about you for open and accountable elections? Do you have suggestions for improvements to the program? Oh yeah, I, I do. But for the most part, I think that uh, we need to keep it. And I'd suggest that they keep this program because it's allowed me to have over 700 uh, individual uh, donors that who have never uh, donated before. I, I, I think if I look at, at this race, I have so many people who donated $10, $5 to me, even $2 that they have never voted for me before, but they also, they've never given me money. And to be able to talk with them about some of their issues and identify uh, policies that I think will be supportive, I think this program, it has to be in place because when you find folks who wanna serve and wanna run, they think that they don't have an infrastructure or the money to run or the, or the right type of friends to, to give them money. I, I, I think that this is a, a great uh, opportunity to level the playing field for uh, minority candidates, for low income candidates, to make sure that everyone has an opportunity at success at being a public servant because it is honorable work. And I think I'd do everything that I could to make sure that this program is successful and that it remains. Thank you very much. That concludes our questions for today. And it is now time for our candidates closing remarks. And uh, Ms. Smith, you go first. Okay, great. Um, it is a great privilege and an honor to be able to run for city council. As a person who is the first person in my family to graduate from college, I attended Oregon State University and I worked for a man who was one of the best uh, public servants that I know. And I learned that it's so important to make sure that all of your community is represented in terms of being public servants. I also think that this last uh, 20 years of my life, I've had an opportunity to do some wonderful things to help the most vulnerable, like securing $50 million to make Head Start buildings in Oregon eco-friendly, uh, partnering with my old friend, uh, Diane McKeel, to help uh, get beds for victims of child sexual exploitation, expanding funding for Oregon Partnership and Oregon Pro Project Independence to keep seniors in their homes. And I funded housing units for people experiencing mental health crisis and addiction. And one of the things that I'm very proud of over the years that I created a summer jobs program uh, for the most vulnerable youth in our community. And I also partnered with my old friend, Nick Fish, to help to uh, develop and support Cully Park and the Sun School uh, field renovations. And in closing, I think the investment of $6 million in wraparound services for low-income families and communities of color that helped their youth graduate from high school has been a huge highlight of my career. I look forward to working with the entire board. And I think that making sure that all of us, that all of us have an open door to making sure that we can hear all the voices is gonna be key to this next commission. Thank you very much. And Mr. Ryan, your two minutes. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having this forum today. It's been wonderful. It's been very conversational. I appreciate the tone. And I will just say that for me, um, having a career 35 years in the community sector, you know, raising money and getting the community mobilized for good causes, whether it was in the arts or healthcare or education, um, really has allowed me to be creative and know how to actually move around government. And let it be more community driven and how can government actually be nimble and and actually helpful to the people out there 
that are doing the innovation. I feel as though what I've experienced too often is government is an impediment. They get in the way. And we need more creativity and less, um, less micro compliance, but, you know, not less checking of the boxes and more actually creativity and partnering. And that's what I've always done. Um, when I look at getting results, to me, that's what it's about. It's about measuring things. It's about being honest when we're failing and figuring out how to improve. And so when the high school graduation crisis was hitting our city for decades and nothing was moving, it needed to become a population, the big community, community issue a complex one, not just sequestered into the echo chambers of one sector. So I'm somebody that brings together different sectors. I'm a team player. And what I loved about that is we saw racial equity finally not just be a proclamation and a noun, but actually a verb, we saw action. So when we saw high school graduation rates improve, we saw them improve expressly for African-American and Latinx students. For me, you're not doing racial equity work unless you're measuring it and you're, and you're focusing on strategies and you're including the entire community. I think that it's really important for this city council to figure out how to be functional, to work together as a team, and to have someone that actually comes from the community sector, just like Commissioner-elect Rubio and Commissioner Hardesty. It's time for us to not have business as usual in the status quo. Thank you for your time. Thank you both. This concludes today's forum. We thank each of the candidates for their participation. Audience members? Please share this recording with your family and friends. We all need to be informed voters. This recording and other information about these candidates will be available on uh, the website vote411.org through election day. You should receive your ballot around July 24th. As with all Oregon elections, it is mail-in only. Yay, Oregon. Ballots are due by 8 p.m. on Tuesday, August 11th. Postmarks don't count. Mail them by August 4 to 6th to be sure they're received. And after August 6th, you can find a drop-off location near you, again, by checking vote411.org or your voters pamphlet. This is Debbie Kay for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you for watching. Please be an informed voter. Your vote counts. Thank you.